What's your favorite jam band? What's a jam band? <laughs> it's not just any band. That's my favorite answer. Like fish is a jam band. Like they jam. Like they just jam. They just you can keep also going. say you don't like jam bands. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> Hello and welcome to Talking to Lab with Chris Savage. I'm your host, Chris Savage, and I am joined by the one, the only... Sylvie Lubau. Here she is, everyone. Come on down. Come on down. We have a fantastic interview today with Danny Grant, who is the CEO and co-founder of Jam, which is a developer tool that allows for faster communication between product and engineering about bugs and fixes. This was a delightful interview full of an enormous amount of energy and insight. insight. And really, we got in there on product market fit, how you get there, what that feels like transitioning from being at a big company to running your own thing, the ownership. And, you know, Danny takes so much pride in her work. She's so fun to talk to. And I'm just so excited for people to hear about her journey. This is a really, really great episode. Totally agree. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to start the show. <laughs> I, we're already talking loud, but we're going to just keep it up. We're, we're just, just going to keep, keep talking loud. <laughs> yes. So Sylvie, what's got you talking to loud? Well... Tis the season of Wimbledon. Been watching Tis the a, season. Been watching a lot of tennis, <laughs> and uh, there's um, there's an underdog player, Eubanks, who has just been crushing, just crushing. And his last match was like, it was some of the most breathtaking tennis I've ever watched. You saw it IRL. Yeah, I, I flew to London real quick. Okay, I mean, that's not great. London. Congrats, that's awesome. Yeah, no, you know I can't go to Europe. I don't have a passport. That's I thought valid. you would have solved your passport issue by now. No. I just thought that was your thing. I go to the U.S. Open. I go to Wimbledon. No, I just, you US... know, I just love tennis. Yeah, yeah. Didn't didn't go there IRL, <laughs> but screamed at my TV and did a lot of texting. So yeah, that's good. what's got me talking to you, lad. That's good. That's great. What about you? For me, is very different uh, direction. A little <laughs> bit of a bummer, but I'm just going to be transparent. I'm going to share it. You're bracing for impact. I am. Uh, you ever get um, flash flood warnings? Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've gotten many a flash flood warning in my day. We all have, you know, your phone, bing, bing, boom, boom. And yep. it's like, hey, you, it's a flash flood warning for an hour. And usually yeah, I shout think, out oh, to Montpelier just... right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, on July 4th, lovely day, beautiful, sunny out. Kids are happy, yada, yada. Flash flood warning at like 257. By 315, I had a foot of water in my finished basement. I... And it was like, it was horrible. Like, it, I can only laugh about it now because we're dealing with it. But like, it was like one of those things where you're like, oh, that's a lot of water. That's a lot of rain. And then I look at the window. It's like, wow, it's collecting on the ground very rapidly. It's done this before. It's never reached the top of the window wells, which are like eight inches up. Now it's, it's going up the window. Oh, now it's going to be, and I'm running around and I'm trying to get like a sump pump and I'm doing all these things. It's happening so fast. And I go down that finished part of the basement. It's our playroom. So it's where all the kids' toys are. 90% of their toys are in this area. They're isolated. To get the rest of the house clean. That's where I watch movies. You know, we've watched movies there. We have. That, right? Yep. Um, and I look in the window wells. There's three feet of water in the window wells. Oh, my God. And it, Sylvie, I am not kidding you. I have video footage to prove this. It looks like the Titanic. <laughs> like, it fills up. One of the windows breaks. And the water just starts coming straight yeah. in. I, I mean, was, I think, let me tell you, yeah. I just, it was a disaster. And I feel for like, I mean, I feel for the people in Vermont who've had this like dramatically worse than me. Like we pumped out the water 6,000 gallons. We've had to demo the whole basement. It sucks, but at least like, it's just that. And like, we're dealing with it. And I, and I feel for the people who are like, you know, homes are being moved and all this insane, crazy no, stuff. No, it's crazy. It's, yeah. Um, but yeah, I have trouble not talking about this because it's just such a it's shocking. It's consumed your life yeah, for the last. It's been. It's like, oh, I ran people running lines to drains outside. Like, oh, the drains are broken. Blah blah blah. It's just like yeah. thing after thing. Yeah, I mean, years ago, uh, I had moved to Red Hook in Brooklyn, and um, it was like about a month before Hurricane Sandy hit. So I've had an experience with flash flood warnings and flooding, and it is it's miserable. So my heart goes out to you, goes out to the Vermonters out there. Stay strong. Yeah, Pump well. It sucks. It sucks. 
But what doesn't but, suck? You know what? what doesn't suck at all? What doesn't suck is this interview with Danny, which is fantastic. So let's jump right into the interview with Danny. All right, Danny, so good to have you on the show. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us on Talking Too Loud. It's so good to be here. I was just telling you before, I mean, I'm such a fan of your podcast, so it's unreal to be on the other side. I'll, I watch all of them on YouTube, but I, I won't watch this one. <laughs> Is that how you, you watch them all? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice to see the faces. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I am, I am a I, big yeah. podcast watcher, too. He watches. I watch. I watch. I don't and it's watch. Fun. You don't watch. Sylvie's a purist. She's like, I am. oh, there's video. I don't know about that. I only like audio. I'm like, I think some people like to watch. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I watch also, and I watch a bunch of... The podcast that I can, I, I will often be doing something else. Like I'll be working out or I'll be like cooking or something. And I'm not, I'm not like zeroed in 100% the whole time. But I notice there's certain times, like for me at least as someone who learns, when seeing the people talking, it imprints it better for me. And it's, I find it more engaging. What's your experience like? So, so the other podcast hack I have is uh, I'm an extroverted thinker, which like what I mean by that is I need to talk out loud in order to think. I can't think mm -hmm. inside my own head. And this was all fine and good until we started working remote. And where are the people to externally think and bother with these thoughts? So my hack for this is I'll go on a walk and I'll listen to a podcast. And about 10 minutes in, I'll stop listening. It's still going. But those words that were said just sort of triggers the process of thinking, like my own LLM goes off. And so this is the only way I have clear thinking is I'll put on a podcast just in the, like, just to get the words going in my, in my brain. That's Love interesting. That. I am also someone who is very extroverted and likes to talk out ideas, which can throw people off too, because like, you know, given my role, I'll be like, Hey, what do you think about X, Y, Z? And someone's like, Oh God, does that mean we're doing that? I'm like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that <laughs> I'm actually trying to work through an idea with you right now. And, it, and so it, I think maybe I wonder if that's also why I like the visuals of podcasts too. I also recently figured out I have accidentally, I've like associated comedy podcasts with my workouts. And so I will often be working out laughing, like legit, like laughing throughout. So I don't have to How pause do you have and take enough oxygen to well, laugh? Well, it's funny. I don't know, but it's like this positive reward system now of like. That's incredible. Yeah. So That's I'm just like. Dream. And there's like three, at least three I listen to a week. And so I know Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, like what they are. And I'll be laughing. And every once in a while, I'm like, okay, I'm doing something where I really need to focus. I have to literally stop this. And I'll stop it. And I'll do my workout. I'll go back to it. It's like, uh, but I've accidentally, it's just evolved to this place where now I just get rewarded. Every time I work out, I get rewarded with laughs, which is like not what I expected, but it's been lovely. That's amazing. I want that in my life. My hack for working out is... Um, I, I am the type of person that when I start running, I think, oh no, I will probably die. This is an unreal amount of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can my body withstand this? Um, and so um, the, you know, uh, I run on these treadmills that have like, you know, apps in them, they have YouTube. Yeah. And I'll put on like figure skating Olympics mm -hmm. and I'll, or like gymnastics Olympics and I'll watch Olympians do feats of strength while running. And I think wow. to myself like, if they can do that, yeah. I can probably run another two minutes. <laughs> I love that. It's amazing the power of positive association. And I think that makes me think, you know, you're here on Talking Too Loud. We're already talking loud, but I need to know, like, if what has got you talking too loud? What are the positive associations you have right now? What are the things you're excited about? Recently, I've been feeling like that feeling you had when you're 16 and you discovered Photoshop for the first time. I don't know if that's something you relate to. There's like, it's such a human <laughs> thing to be able to create things that wow other people or just elicit some spark. That's the joy of building products. Like when you grow up and you can build products, like the reason why you do it is because you get that spark from the other people that use it and you show it to. And, and so I've been using all these AI tools and they're yeah. so fun. And, you know, I think there is some fatigue of like, gosh, no one wants to see another mid journey image. Like we get it. It's nice, <laughs> but making it oh oh my God. <laughs> So, okay, here are some of the tools and things I've been making. Like yesterday, uh, marketing asks for a 10 second demo. And I'm like, I have an idea. Be right back. Two hours later, I am like <laughs> deep in the runway ML rabbit hole where you can upload a clip of you speaking and then give it a prompt. Like you upload the video, you give it a prompt like 1990s and then it will redo the video, keeping your audio. 
with that new prompt. So oh. I'll be like, bug reporting hasn't changed since the 1990s. And then it's like, you know, me as a baby. Wait, that I just watched that video on Twitter. Yeah, That's that, amazing. I posted it in Slack and I was like, this should probably never see the light of day. And then it has. Turns out that's the stuff that everyone wants to see. <laughs> it has. And I was, I was totally into it. It was great. Oh my gosh. There's a tool called Leonardo AI, which is like mid journey, but you don't have to fuss about with discord. I am, I'm not 30 yet. I feel way too old for discord. So <laughs> with, with Leonardo, what you can do is you can upload a picture of your logo and then feed in a prompt and it will change the logo for that prompt. So like, we did like a social post where we changed our logo instead of being like jam it was full of coffee beans but it was still our logo recognized yeah, yeah, yeah. so we're like speed up your bug reporting in two ways coffee and yeah. so it, it's just so fun to to create that's awesome i love that and i i 100 feel you on the playing with this stuff and making things and creating things and like i'm just a, i'm a huge believer in play as a way to learn you know and like, I think that's a lot of what we get to do with AI right now. It's just like, uh, you know, without having to get permission, you can go in and, you know, the, even this the example that you gave of the 90s, like changing it to be the 90s, like that wasn't possible like three months ago. Yes. Right. And so it's like, who, what should we do with this? What ideas there's, it's like the only thing holding <laughs> us back in many cases, our ideas, which is a very new place to be in. And I think a lot of people to your, to your point have AI fatigue right now. And so it's really easy to just, you know, see the feed of stuff coming out and be like another AI thing and just like not want to engage. There's so much exciting stuff. If you can look at it from the perspective, like I just need to play. Yes. Um, here's one tool that I think every single person who needs to create marketing content needs to check out. It's called Aphlerythmic. It's in private beta. This team does not realize how good their tool is. Like if so, they would start charging immediately and let everyone join and then they'd all be millionaires. <laughs> it lets you just copy paste your text from your landing page into a box. And then you wait about 30 seconds while it thinks. And then it spits out an awesome audio ad. We just like copy pasted our landing page into that box. We hit create. It spit out an amazing 30 second audio ad. We put like 30 second of random video in front of it. And we ran it as a YouTube as, as an experiment. It has a 90% watch rate. Have you ever watched past the fifth second of a That's YouTube insane. ad? That's no, like insane. you're like waiting to hit next, but this AI is so good. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. I want to see all of these things. And I, I mean, honestly, what I want to do is actually like play it in the episode. Attention all AI startups. Imagine this. You're testing your cutting edge AI and suddenly it does something unexpected. Introducing Jam, the ultimate bug reporting tool designed perfectly for AI startups. With just a click, Jam instantly creates detailed bug reports with console logs, network requests, and device information. But that's not all. Jam also features an instant replay function, so you can easily share what just happened with your engineers. Say goodbye to frustrating bugs and hello to seamless debugging with Jam. That was insane. Oh, that was really good. I can't that was believe so good. that. That was so nuts. <laughs> wow. Okay, look, Danny, we jumped right in. I want listeners to know who you are. I want them to know about Jam. I want them to know what this whole thing is, how you got started. Please tell us. I started my career and also the story of Jam starts at a company called Cloudflare. I joined at about 100 people, saw it grow to 1,000. And around like 500 people, the company was like, we want to take risks the way we could when we were a small startup, but we can't bet the company each time. So they created this. I've never seen this before, but they created this skunk works lab off in the corner that could take huge risks and launch new businesses for the company, but without distracting everyone else. So everyone can just keep focusing on customers. And so my now co-founder and I were the two product managers on that team. And we got to launch crazy experimental stuff, but we had to do it really, really fast. And it had to work great out of the gate. And it was in that process of like trying to be ambitious, trying to move fast, trying to ship awesome stuff that we just realized like, oh my God, the amount of time we are spending and the amount of slowdown on communicating about bugs and issues, it's just, it, it sucks. It makes us as the product managers just sort of feel dumb and frustrated. And it makes the engineers feel angry <laughs> and like we're not respecting their time. And so we realized we need a comprehensive and easy way to just share what we were experiencing in our apps with engineers. And so we built Jam. It's a browser extension. You click on it when you see something go wrong and it just grabs last 30 seconds what happened, plus all the console logs and network requests and whatever. Instantly creates a link. You just share it with engineers and they can at a glance see what the bug was. And so there's no like clarification question back and forth hopping on a call. It's just easier. So 
we opened up this product a year and two months ago, like to the web, like who wants to try it? And today uh, we just passed 30,000 users. It's growing really fast. We love our users. They are builders and they're all about building fast and we're getting to meet them. And it's, it's been, it's been amazing. That's amazing. And that was separate from like, you saw this opportunity while working at Cloudflare and then started this separately. Is that right? Yes. How did you know that that's what you should do? Like, how did you, how, like, can you walk us through that moment a little bit? Just because I feel like a lot of times people see opportunities and then they can't figure out like, should I quit my job for this? Should I not? Like, should I, what, where should this live? Or like, should I, if I mention it, what, like, how did you actually go from seeing that opportunity to being like, yes, like, this is it. We're going to actually leave. We're going to go do this. There was a little bit of time in between. So I went off to join USV as an investor for two years. Uh, my co-founder was still at Cloudflare. And the whole time we thought, maybe we should start a company together. Wouldn't that be a great adventure? But we didn't know what to do. Like a lot of people thinking about starting companies. So we did the thing that a lot of people starting companies do, which in hindsight is... Uh, not not great. So we created a Notion doc full of ideas. We had like a hundred ideas in there of things we could start. And we had set up a call to talk through our Notion doc and discuss our ideas. And we got so lucky because before we could even discuss the Notion doc, we just started talking about, you know, my co-founder Ertis always telling me about how things were going on that team, you know, like the gossip. And we were talking about this process and, and how engineers were being asked to track things in like multiple spreadsheets and Jira because everyone needed to be anyway. And we just realized like, wait, ignore the notion. Shouldn't we just fix the thing that we experienced so much? And that's when we knew it's, it's time it's time to start this. Um, I think that when you're at the beginning of the journey and you're about to start a company for the first time, one thing you might not appreciate is, well, if you're if you get very lucky and it goes well, this is probably going to be a decade of your life, maybe more. And it's not just that it's a decade of your life, but it's that everyone you meet in every conversation you have will be about this topic. Like even when you go to a party and you meet someone new and they ask you, what do you do? Then they're going to have follow-up questions about your company. Or when you go see your family, they're going to ask you how your company's doing. So it's like literally every conversation you have has to be about this topic. And so you have to choose something that you can spend a decade without getting bored with continuing to talk too loud. I think that we didn't appreciate that when we made our notion and we lucked into something that we had experienced and we love. That's awesome. I think just hearing about your story is helpful, right? Because if someone is inside a company and sees an opportunity or is thinking about that and like that moment of understanding, like, wow, this really is big and like we're excited about that, that is the the moment like you're taking your breath and you're doing the big thing, right? And so it's just it's it's awesome to hear that. The other thing I, I think that's I can tell from you and your vibe is very much like you are totally comfortable putting yourself out there. You're comfortable with this idea of it being a decade. You're excited about this. I'm, I'm a believer also that like passion comes from progress and success. And it's like, you actually can get passionate about a lot of different things, but like you have to be growing, you have to be excited, you have to be expressing yourself. At least for me, that's what I look for in, in things. And then it can, if you can do that, like that is actually the dream. I will say something else. So when, Passion is so important, but for a really non obvious reason that you just touched on. And I think this is really important. And I think that most founders don't appreciate this. And certainly I did not when we were starting, which is when you hear about, you know, your favorite product companies and you hear about their stories, usually it starts with they search for product market fit for about two years. Like I love Notion. Notion spent two and a half years looking for product market fit. I love Sigma. They took four years to launch. Airtable, two years to product market fit. Slack, two years. And that's after they pivoted from video game company. So Two years, it's like, okay, but that means waking up every single day for two years, working so hard to the point of exhaustion and not seeing results, but knowing that you should keep going. And oftentimes passion for something comes from seeing progress. That's just how we're wired. Yeah. And that's why we, you know, are productive and able to invent things. But actually searching for product market fit is nonlinear. And so you have to find the passion intrinsically and it has to be worth it to wake up and keep going despite not seeing any progress. So I, I think I think that's the reason why most startups fail is somewhere in those two years, founders are like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> I give up. Well, it's also interesting because even at the top of, uh, you you know, all those companies you just listed, like they can find product market, market fit and start growing. And then there will still be moments of huge challenge. And sometimes those moments last years. And it's interesting, like reminds me of a couple of weeks ago, I was really fortunate and I went to 
Um, I'm a big F1 fan, and I got to go to the uh, Montreal like Grand Prix and was a guest of Aston Martin, which is one of the 10 teams. And so I'm like in the garage and I'm seeing the drivers get in the cars before like qualifying all this. It was utterly insane. Like I cannot believe it happened, but I'm asking a million questions. I'm in like podcast mode the whole time. Like I'm in a car with someone. I'm like, who are you? What do you do? I'm just going to ask questions, questions, questions. Question. And I asked them because they've been, there's like 10 teams, 20 drivers. They've been middle of the pack, which means like, you know, seventh to 12th for the last like few years. And very recently they've been at the top. So they're like second or third. And uh, I'm like, what does it feel like? What does that feel like to actually have that that progress? And it was, I heard a really interesting thing, which was, so they were already putting in 100% of the effort every time. Like the effort the engineers put into working on the car at, like day in, day out is the same that has been for years. But now, because everything is clicking, they're getting a lot more reward than they've ever gotten before. Wow. And there was something about that that like really resonated with me because like you're talking about that in the beginning, right? It's like looking for prime market fit. You are putting in huge effort every day trying to connect, trying to get stuff to work. And then ideally, you know, someone ends up in a situation that's similar to Jam and they're growing and like people love this thing. And then you'll hit moments which are like, wow, the competition has switched or we have some churn problem or we got too focused on some other issue or what, whatever. And then you could end up again, putting in a hundred percent effort at the top of your game and not seeing the rewards until suddenly like you get the outsized rewards. And it was something that just like resonated with me so deeply because I've been doing this 17 years and like, I've had those exact moments of like total breakthrough. This feels incredible. And I've had moments of like, man, that we're toiling. Like we are toiling. We are trying every day to get this stuff to work. And so it's this interesting, a lot of it's like psychological and mindset and, you know, baseline of what it's like to work with other people. And if you get that right, that is what lets you push through to get the breakthroughs. There was this, this, there was a moment while we were searching for product market fit. I think we were like, we were like a year and something in, I was starting to feel a little tired and, um, and stressed. Like, what if, what if we don't figure it out? Like, what if we raise money? What if we hired a team? What if we made promises to users that will will solve this problem for them? Yeah. And actually, we won't get there. And it it was like like you, you can't see the future, right? So yeah. so in that moment, it, it felt really scary. And it was the Olympics, and um, it was the day Simone Biles chose not to compete because mm. her anxiety got the better of her. And the Olympics and startups, it's two different things. Like, of course, it's not the same level of intensity. I saw that, and I was like, yes, your brain. It, the sport is the brain. Like, yes, we're working hard, but it's it's all about the psychology. And if we can move past it and enjoy the journey and 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 just do the startup and just keep going because we love to build and, and we love the problem, then we will get there. Um, and I think about three, four months later, we we got there. So, but just seeing that, yeah, similar to what you're saying, you just sort of have to keep going. You know, I saw um, the CEO of Box put this thing on Threads the other day. Uh, <laughs> that was was. <laughs> Basically, one of the big challenges when you're scaling is figuring out, do you need to pivot from the idea you have, or do you need to double down on the idea you have? And it's, it's interesting. It's got me thinking because, of course, that's what a lot of these decisions are. It's like, well, we built this new thing. No one's using it. Is that because we haven't been on it long enough? Or is it because um, we actually have been, we've given it enough, and we need to change course? How do you think about that today as someone who's just like unlocked product market fit? What advice would you give to others? Or do you have any reflection on your own experience in that moment, trying to decide if you should keep going or not? When we first started, the first thing we did is we did 45 user interviews to just determine, was this a problem experienced at Cloudflare or was this an industry-wide problem? And the best book to help any founder do these user interviews is a book called The Mom Test. It's all about like doing foolproof user interviews such that you could even user interview your mom, the person who wants you to succeed the most in the world, just wants to tell you what you want to hear and still get actionable insight. So if I were to start another company today, I would download that book on an audiobook. Like it's like two hours and it's, it's exactly right. So we started with that and we just heard such passion, like such frustration, real emotion. And so much so that the second or third person we interviewed 
was like, I'm on board, can I make your logo? So an amazing designer, Jeff Anders, after that user interview, made the Jam logo and brand guidelines that we still use today. Um, one user tried to pay and set up an onboarding with his team and we're like, we're so sorry, nothing exists. There was something real there. And so we knew there was problem market fit. The only question was how to solve it. We're like, what's the product solution to the, this problem that's never had a product solution to it before? And that took a really long time. And what we kept seeing is that people were signing up in mass. If we just tweeted or launched something on Product Hunt, the problem resonated so much, thousands of people were signing up, but they weren't retaining. And that told us, this messaging and positioning works. People are willing to jump through hoops. They're even willing to pay, but the product doesn't solve it. And, and so we realized the most important metric to track is retention. And we became hyper-focused on retention as the only thing that matters because you can't fake retention. No one's going to come back to your product and pretend to use it for you. And so my co-founder, kudos to him. I love that. Yeah, you can't great, fake retention. That is... Woo. He made a spreadsheet with alpha users down, down one column and then every single week. And every week he would color in whether or not those alpha users had used the product and he would look it up manually. And what we were looking for was streaks. We just wanted green lines that people had used it. And those early users, they, they didn't know they were some of our first users, but they did find it odd that we reached out every time they went on vacation or had a sick day. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I remember in the latest iteration of the product when we were 19 weeks in and there were two teams that had 19 week streaks and we said okay this is the direction that's awesome wow. i mean that's an incredible way to think about it um and i think like if you are in this position that danny is describing like focusing on that retention is so critical to know if you have a real thing i'm also interested when you were talking about that Let's go back to Cloudflare. Do you think you could, if you were to take these lessons back, would you change what you were doing in that setting too? So building a feature on top of a platform that already exists and has distribution and people come to every day and you know has economies of scale is a very, very different beast. And so I didn't fully appreciate that when we first started down the rabbit hole of building a startup. And so it is very different. Um, but the way that we built product in this sort of off to the side studio at Cloudflare is the way we build product at Jam because it's really great for shipping high quality stuff fast. So it's a four step process. The first step is you build a prototype that its purpose is to be deleted. And the reason to build the prototype is to get something fast that everyone can see and play with. And that's when the ideas start to spark. And that's when you can see like, does this get us excited? Is this even worth building? And the reason to have the purpose of deleting it is that engineers don't have to make long-term plans about it. You don't need to have a solid foundation. It's for deleting. Then the next step after the proof of concept is to build an internal beta. So no external users can use this until it's good enough for us. And the reason for that is because you won't believe the pushback people will get internally for something that's not good enough. Our internal bar is really high and it's for something that we're building. So it better be good enough for us before it goes to anyone external. Then third step is external beta and then fourth step is launch. And so uh, we didn't do that early on at Jam. And the result is that we shipped too fast. Before we were even using the product, we tried to get external feedback. And even if you nag your users, that feedback loop is so slow that we were not getting insights fast enough. But in the final iteration, the one that works, like the one that is Jam today, we did not ship until we would miss it when it's gone. And those few weeks, were the fastest we had ever iterated on products and we got the product so good so fast. It's interesting because most of the startup wisdom out there is ship fast, get it into users' hands as fast as we can. I would actually say in 2023, when the bar for software is so high, don't do that. Actually ship fast internally, improve it internally, and then ship to users. Don't spend six months internally, but just do that stuff. What do you think people should do if they're not their customer? I think that we had that question too. But we're not so different from our customer that it was two different worlds. And so it was still a useful step, even just like that. Yeah, that was like not a trick question, but I- You we, said it with a trick, like a, you had the like trick question. Look at my <laughs> well, because, well, because I think it eye. is, I, I, when I, like what you're talking about, I'm like, yes, hell yes. Like this is exactly right. And it is like, we, I always refer to it as like, you have to be your own customer. Like you have to actually need to want to use your thing. And if you make stuff and you don't use it or you don't value it, like I want everything you're saying, I huge 100% agree with. Like, it's just like, 
it's crazy because a lot of people don't do that. And it's sad, actually. It's like such a waste of effort and time when someone goes off, they assume they know what the customer wants. They spend an enormous amount of time on something. They put it out there and then they really quickly get feedback that's like, this is not what we want. And it's it's so painful. It's such a painful like thing to go through. And it seems like a trick, like, well, you're really going to use your own stuff. They're like, no, if you actually benefit from it and you have a really high bar, then yes, that is, that is the way you can get these things going. You just have to make sure you're not like wildly different than everybody else in how you do things. Yes, there is some really bad startup advice out there. And I think that this is one of them. People say like, your customers will ask for a faster course to deliver them a car. But like, actually our best success at Jam has been when we listen almost pretty literally to our customers and then try to go above and beyond, um, but not try to reinvent their workflows for them. It's really hard to change people's workflows. It's such a battle that's like so, it's like, it's so easy to think that that's like what you should fight. It's like, oh, I'm gonna give you this totally new way of doing something. It's like, well, actually, I don't wanna learn. <laughs> like, I might take something that's dramatic, it saves me huge amounts of time, saves me huge amounts of money, lets me do something I couldn't do otherwise, but like anchor to something I already, it's actually the same thing as we were talking about, it was like the comedy podcast or the workout. It's like you anchor them together to something you're already doing. And that's how you create the change versus like making a totally new behavior. Yes. And the non obvious thing we kept hearing. So when we started, we thought like we would change people's workflows and we had a better way of doing things. The thing that we kept hearing is very few people in any organization have the social capital and the budget to be able to make those decisions for their teams. And so most people, despite wanting to do something different, actually cannot in most organizations. You know, the other startup advice here that I think is now outdated, it was great advice 10 years ago, but today it no longer stands, but everyone still tells you, is <laughs> Here <people>... we go. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when we were looking for product market fit, everyone told us like, just ship, ship messy stuff. Like you'll know you have product market fit when your customers are jumping through hoops to use this product. Like you'll know it's product market fit when people are willing to use a broken and janky product. And so we believe that to be true. In 2023, in a world with remote work where people like live in SaaS tools, work in SaaS tools, if a tool's not working, it makes them less productive, not more, and it's actually just non-negotiable. They cannot use it. And so to ship a buggy product in 2023, what you're actually gonna see is people leaving. And so you'll see a loss of retention. And if that's the metric you're tracking, you won't know if they're leaving because you have bugs or they're leaving because you don't have product market fit. And even if you ask them, they're going to tell you it's because of bugs because they don't want to hurt your feelings. And so the best thing that we did is we changed course. And instead of being like, we have this vision of the future and we're going to build it. We said, what's the smallest version of this? And small scope, high quality became our internal mocking truck. And that became super important because we couldn't actually have enough clarity to reach product market fit if we had bugs. And we couldn't solve all our bugs unless the scope was small enough. I think you just said something in there, which it really is not said that much. And I think you nailed it. And like, I've been thinking about this a lot too, which is with remote work, that does change the dynamic here. Someone's sitting at home doing this. They're not just in an office. They don't use a tool. There's a problem. Then they complain to somebody else like, yeah, they had this problem too, but like they fixed it. Like, or like, don't worry. You, there's, you're not going to do that. It's different interaction. We do stuff to save our customers time you know, to let them do things they couldn't do otherwise, like to make a workflow faster, to make them more successful. There are a lot of cases where like, if you don't have enough reliability, you are literally doing the exact opposite. You are wasting, you are wasting a lot of time for somebody in a moment that they're trying to like, you know, there, there isn't this other like safety net of like being around other people in person being frustrated, walking through it, talking to somebody else. So it's like more of a, that more, I mean, this podcast is a good example. Like we all got together. We had Steve Petto come on, make sure our setup sounded right. And we're doing our own AV. That is not what would have happened like four years ago. We would have been in person. Someone would have done the AV for all of us. We wouldn't be thinking about it. We are owning more of that. Now the benefit is we have an easier time scheduling this. It's easier to get it done more quickly. We're excited. Everyone's comfortable, blah, blah, blah. But like the downside is very real. Like if this recording doesn't save, like it's going to suck. It's going to suck a lot. And I think that that pain is almost like harder to see or think about for folks. And it really, the negative impact of like lack of reliability 
in this world we're in today, I think is a lot greater than it's than it's been. One thing that we found helpful as we were prioritizing which bugs to fix, because at the beginning that was extremely important to us, is you know the way we think about different brands and the relationship that users might have with a brand is that each brand chooses what to promise their users. Like they make one core promise to their users. Like if you think about Uber, what's the one promise Uber makes you? It's about convenience. And so if the Uber takes 20 minutes to arrive, you actually feel a little bit betrayed. But if the Uber app crashes, you don't care. Or like if the Uber doesn't arrive at all, there are no Ubers available, you feel betrayed because that was their core promise. But a lot of other things can go wrong and you don't feel any betrayal. Um, and so, or like think about Facebook. Facebook, the promise was connection. And as soon as people realize like it's not about connection, it's about mining our data, they felt extremely betrayed. But Facebook could go down for a whole day. No one, it, it's not a betrayal, it's just a mistake. And so identify what's the core promise of your brand and what's the one thing to keep sacred and never betray became really important. So for example, we're recording now on Riverside. As you said, if, if Riverside lost this recording, they would betray the one promise um, that they made us. So, but everything else can fail and um, it would be okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I want, I, I mean, I'm just in so much agreement. This is a, this is a delight. Um, so I wanna go one step deeper basically on your market. And I'm, I'm just wondering now that you've been in the space and you see this opportunity and you're getting all this traction, like why do you think the world of bug reporting has been so, would you describe it as stagnant? Like, what, like why do you think it's been behind the times? It's so interesting. Most things in software engineering have changed, you know, a hundredfold since the 1990s. Like it's unrecognizable today. The way we do bug reporting hasn't changed at all. It is exactly the same as it was in the 1990s. We went from reporting bugs over emails and text files and databases to UIs like Jira that have some nice like tracking features. But the way the bug report is created is still entirely manual. Like it is up to the person reporting the bug to figure out what information the engineers need. And most people are not trained in that, don't have any technical background and don't have like, just don't have the ability to do that. It's sort of like we're expected to show up at the car mechanic and instead of the car mechanic, like opening up the box that has all the diagnostics, we're expected to report what's wrong with the car. Like it's impossible. I think that a lot of companies have experienced engineers being blocked on not having enough information and having that frustration between teams. But the job of an engineer at any company is to just fight through, like just to crawl through the glass of organizational fruff to ship for users. And so you can never stop and rethink like, how should we change our bug reporting process? Instead, it actually takes a whole company to be fully focused on it to improve it for everyone else. Okay, we're running low on time. We are. I want to, I have to get to the rapid fire section now. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so we're going to go through some rapid fire questions, try to answer them <laughs> in like one sentence or one word. Just we'll keep it quick. Um, are you ready? This is the most stressful part so far. I am so ready. <laughs> Good. Don't, don't be stressed. Don't worry. Because the theme of today's rapid fire is favorite jams. <laughs> so we're going to start. What's your favorite flavor of jam? All the spicy jams. The spicy jams are amazing. If you've never tried a spicy jam, do yourself a favor, buy a spicy jam. Perfect. We'll do that. How about uh, who is somebody whose work you admire and would totally want to jam out with? Oh my gosh. I've been listening to a lot of Lenny's podcast and his thoughtfulness. Like he has a craft around how he podcasts and the questions he asks and the guests he brings on. It's And just his product. And I, I mean, I, I think he's brilliant. I'm, I'm just a fan. Yeah, he's crushing it. Um, what was the best moment for Jam in the last year? Oh my gosh, uh, this sounds so silly, but we migrated our database to zero incident. But here's the thing. So uh, <laughs> I got to be on the call, listening in to the engineers migrate the database. And it was like, they treated each other with such respect. They had full plan and plans for like, what would happen, here are all the things that could go wrong and what we're gonna do in those cases. They were checking all of our logs to make sure no users running into issues and communicating with them where they were. And I just sat back and I was just listening in and I was like, this is a cool team. Like, go you. Look, that's the, that's the best answer I could have ever, ever imagined hearing. Um, that was so, your, your pride in your team, in what you're They're building, amazing. it's just come, it's coming through, it's infectious, it's delightful. Danny, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We re I really enjoyed this. I hope we connect more and like chat more in the future. And I'm, I'm so excited for you. Excited to see the path. Excited to see where you guys end up. Where can people connect with you to learn more? I'm on all the socials, the Danny Grant on Twitter, Danny Grant on LinkedIn. Um, 
I, I want to chat with your listeners. I love your show and I'm so happy to get to go on. Thank you for having me. Okay, that was so fun. I and we that just was, we were just smiling like idiots the whole time. Yeah, and we just blew through the time. I'm getting messages. You're like, we're about to run out of time. Do I know. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> How is it already like? Yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So many nuggets in there. So many nuggets about like getting traction, what that feels like, toiling through hard stuff, making it work in a larger organization, in all these things. And, um, Danny is just such, she's so smart and she's such a great communicator. And I really, I really hope people listen and like re listen to the right parts of this episode that are relevant to the challenges they're going through. Because I think, um, there's, there's just so much in it that is so relevant and so helpful. Yeah. I feel like the two big things for me were like, one, it is crazy that bug reporting hasn't transformed the way that other software uh, products have transformed. Like why it got stuck in this manual phase is like so bizarre. And when she said it turns out like it takes a whole company to work and solve on this problem, it clicked. It made a lot of sense because often you don't have the time to like stop and look around and like figure it out. So that was one. And then the other was like, I think she, what she was talking about finding product market fit and it was this idea and i think you and i both reacted to this like you can't fake retention mm -hmm. like i was like oh shit. like that was a mic drop that was a <laughs> mic drop you can't you can't fake retention no no you can't and i think that's that is the number that you know it's it's i mean not to bring it back to threads but like that's the that's the question for that product, right? It's like 100 million signups faster than ever before, but how many people are going to be there in a week and how many people are going to be there in a month? And we, and we don't know. And if they are, whatever, if that, if of that 100 million that signed up, they're all there, then you have something wildly successful and you might have 10 million, you might have one, who knows? I think it's, I don't think it, it is. I don't think it's going to retain. That's my, yeah, that's I, my prediction. That's your prediction. I think it's just like in general, very easy to focus on vanity metrics and that this is not one. And so that's why I think it's like really so good advice and so helpful true. to think about. And also like, if you're gonna pick one, you it's much easier to grow a business if you have high retention than if you don't. Like if you have high retention, you're solving a problem consistently, that you know every cohort that comes in every month, you get more customers, they get to add on top as opposed to make up for the churn that you had previously. Same thing as if you expand your product, you have more expansions, more upgrade paths and all of these things. And so it's a really, really foundational thing. Um, and it was just very cool to to hear that and see that and, and have that translate. And I think um, also really makes me want to go play with Jam. So I'm excited to check that out. Go myself. Jam on Jam. Go, go jam, jam on Jam on Jam. That's right. And if you want to jam with us, uh, please, if you're jamming, if you love jam bands, uh, then please, you know, write a review wherever you listen to the podcast. It's super helpful. Helps get the word out there. Of course, always email us if you have ideas of potential guests or things you want us to cover. You can email us at ttlpod at wistia.com. And you can find Sylvia and I both on Twitter. Sylvia is Give Me the Loot. I am C Savage on LinkedIn, where we spend a lot more time these days. And you'll also find me on threads for the next month or two. I'm not we'll there yet. But... She won't, Sylvie won't be there. Maybe. Um, I think that's it, right, Sylvie? That's it. <laughs> See you, everybody.